Hi everyone, I'm back with another Camino video today. I'm gonna to be talking about one of the lesser traveled Camino routes. So if you missed my last video, I was breaking down a few of the different Camino routes through Spain and also Portugal. I kind of highlighted the top four routes um, broke them down, talked about the differences. So check out that video if you haven't already. But today I'm going to start off like a small series of the lesser traveled Camino routes. So these are all different paths that I've walked personally. Um, there are a lot of Camino paths all through Spain, through France, through Europe. Um, I've walked maybe a total of seven or eight at this point. So I'm going to be speaking to the ones that I have experience with. And I think in the next couple of weeks or month, I'm going to highlight a different walk with each video to try to keep these videos a little bit shorter. So today we're going to talk just a little bit about the Chemin du Puy. So the Chemin du Puy is a route that runs through France. So there's also, just like in Spain, a network of pilgrimage trails that run through France, all head towards Spain, and then eventually on to Santiago de Compostela. Uh, in France, while there are a number of different routes, there tend to be four kind of more popular routes and the Chemin du Puy is the most popular of the routes through France. So I think the first thing to talk about with the Chemin du Puy um, is the length of it. So it begins in Le puy en velay and it goes to Saint-Jean-Pied-de-Port, which is the beginning of the Camino Française. Uh, it's a total of, I think, 736 kilometers. So it takes about four to five weeks to walk. Um, I think some pilgrims will start in Le Puy, walk about a month to Saint-Jean-Pied-de-Port, and then continue on the Camino Francaise and continue on to Santiago. That's going to take about two months, maybe a bit more to walk. Um, it's actually what I kind of wanted to do when I was planning my first Camino, and I just didn't have enough time, so I started in Saint-Jean and walked to Santiago. Um, but the Chemin du Puy was sort of always in the back of my mind. Um, I can speak French and that's one of the reasons that it really appealed to me. So I did go back in 2017 um, and at the time I only had two weeks to walk so I walked to uh, from the Puy to Cahors and then the following year I actually had a few extra days at the end of some travel so I walked three more days to Moissac. So I walked the first 17 days of this trail and the beginning part anyway, the first like 10 days to Conk, if not the first maybe two weeks about to where I walked in Cahor, is considered the most beautiful part. And that's where you're going to see more pilgrims. Um, when I'm talking about pilgrim numbers on this route, now, you know, it's been, I think coming on the summer, it'll been about been about five years since I walked. So I'm not sure if this route's gotten a lot more popular. There aren't too, too many pilgrims. Um, Definitely a Camino route, though, where you are going to meet other pilgrims. There's definitely a pilgrim community in the places I stayed in the evenings. I was always with other pilgrims, um, but it doesn't have anywhere near the crowds that the Camino Frances will have or even the route in Portugal has. One big difference with this route compared to a lot of the Caminos maybe in Spain or at least the kind of more popular Camino routes that I had highlighted is that this route is mostly made up of French pilgrims or French speaking pilgrims. Um, but I would say pilgrims from France are going to be, you know, the most common that you will see. Um, sometimes the crowd tends to sway a little bit older as well. Um, you know, you do see a variety of ages and, and certainly of nationalities too. Um, but my experience, and I think the experience of a lot of pilgrims is that you're mostly going to meet other French pilgrims. I think when you know the language or can kind of communicate in French, that's going to help a lot on this Camino. It's though certainly no reason not to walk. I've also met a lot of people who have walked this route, couldn't speak French and still had a wonderful time. Um, it's just good to know though that at times it might be kind of isolating if you're not able to communicate in French. Um, what tends to happen, and I'll speak to kind of the setup with the places you stay and how the meals work in a few minutes, um, but there tend to be um, a lot of common dinners where pilgrims gather and eat together and usually the conversations at these dinners are all in French and my experience you know being able to speak some French helped a lot but I wasn't fluent enough that I could really follow the dinner time conversations well especially when they're going really fast and people were talking all at once I felt kind of lost I know that can be the experience when you don't speak the language well that's not to say though that the pilgrims on this route the French pilgrims won't make an effort to speak English if they know English um, I think if they know that there is someone who can't speak in French at all 
and they know some English, they'll definitely try to, to speak in English to make sure everyone's included. Um, but just kind of know that French is going to be sort of like the dominant language of this route. So some other things to note about this route, um, the terrain, it's not as challenging as some Camino routes. I kind of tend to compare it in my mind a little bit to the Camino del Norte. I think the Norte is a little bit more challenging than this one. Um, I would say for the Chemin du Puy, the most challenging part kind of comes within those first 10 days. And then afterwards it gets a little bit easier. So um, I, <laughs> If someone only has like a section to walk, I would still recommend starting at Le Puy and walking those first 10 or so days to Conk. I think that's kind of the most commonly walked section of this trail. It is the most beautiful. So even if it is a little more challenging than maybe the second half, I'd still recommend starting at the beginning and doing that first part. And then just kind of figure, you know, you kind of get your workout and you kind of build up your strength in the beginning and then maybe the second half is a walk in the park. <laughs> um, it is a really, really beautiful route though. It's France is the landscape in this part of the country is really stunning. You're going through a lot of countryside. You're not really through any big mountainous areas, but you know, you're going up and down some rolling hills. There's an area called the Obrac Plateau, which is this kind of wide open, expansive area that is really, I mean, it's a really special, special area and really beautiful part of the walk. Um, the places that you stay, typically, again, it's a range, so you can find private lodging, um, but they're also places called the Gites d'Etape, which are essentially like the albergues in Spain. The Gites tend to be, they tend to have smaller rooms with maybe four to six beds. There are some bunk beds, but there are a lot of Gites that don't have bunk beds at all, which is kind of nice. And what's really common in the Gites is that many will offer like a demi pension so that you're paying for your bed, for your dinner in the evening and for breakfast the next morning. And the dinners are often like a communal affair so that most people staying in the Gites will all eat dinner together. Uh, the cost of these is a little more than in Spain. I think for a demi pension, it's gonna be between 30 and 40 euros. 35 euros is pretty common. And then if you kind of add on, you know, your lunch as you're walking, drinks and snacks, you're looking at maybe 40 to 50 euros a day for this walk. Um, a note on the food though, the food is excellent. It's really good. <laughs> it's really, really good. Um, and I know that's a highlight for many people who walk this route. Um, reservations are recommended if you're going to be staying in the Gites and especially if you're going to be eating the meals and the evening meals um, because the people running the, the Gites kind of need to know how many to expect so that they can prepare the meal. And so it's kind of very standard when walking in the Chemin du Puy um, to call ahead a day or two in advance to make a reservation for the next night. And that was a bit of an adjustment for me. You know, up until that point, I had walked Caminos in Spain and never made reservations. But in France, I just kind of got used to it. Um, I think before I went, I reserved the first maybe three or four nights just to kind of have that taken care of before I left. And then once I was on the way, I just sort of usually would sit down one day and kind of look ahead again at like three to four stages and kind of figure out what I wanted to do. Sometimes reserving a few nights at once, sometimes just doing day to day. So just calling the day before. Uh, if you don't speak French, usually the place that you stay in the previous night can help phone ahead and make a reservation for you the next night. There are very friendly pilgrims who will do it for you and will who, who will help you out. So hopefully that won't be too big of a hurdle or anything too difficult. Um, I do think camping is allowed in France and some pilgrims I met camped. Um, I would say though that like I really love staying in the Gites and there's such a beautiful Camino spirit there and can really provide some nice, a nice sense of just community um, and connection. So while I think camping is possible, I think it can also be nice to stay in some of the communal spaces as well. I think another small difference is that the infrastructure on the Chemin du Puy isn't built up as much for pilgrims. So this isn't going to be a Camino where every five, six, seven kilometers, you're passing through a village with a shop and a bar and a plate and a pharmacy. I mean, there are pharmacies in the villages and you're not walking in wilderness. You know, again, you're not in the middle of nowhere, but 
in France, um, the shops have kind of funny hours. <laughs> so often you'll be passing through and thinking, oh, there's a boulangerie here, or there's a little place where I can buy snacks, or there's supposed to be a bar, um, but you'll find that it's closed. So I found that it was usually good to try to always carry just like a little backup for food. Um, it, generally though, it's not a huge problem. And I think in my memory anyway, I often found places to get lunch every day. Um, or if I set off in the morning, there was usually a boulangerie open. So I could always have, you know, stuff to be prepared with for the day. Um, it's a route that can be walked at all times of the year. I think spring and fall tend to be probably the most beautiful and kind of best weather to walk. I walked in the summer and some days were hot, but overall it was fine. The way marking is pretty good. Um, there are are a few guidebooks. I might link to some guidebook options below this video. Uh, the one that I used, um, Yam Yam Dodo, which is a very um, kind of popular line of guidebooks in France. It's all in French, but I really think you don't need to speak French to be able to use it. Um, it's pretty easy to figure out. So I think that is probably, those are probably the highlights of this route. Oh, one extra thing, which I thought was so funny as I walked. Um, Every like three or four days, it seemed, I would see a sign kind of advertising like a village that was just ahead. And the sign proclaimed that village to be the most beautiful village in France. And I think I saw three, four, maybe five of the villages that were supposed to be the most beautiful, um, which always made me laugh. But that speaks to just how beautiful of an area of France you're walking through. There truly were some like really, really stunning villages. So I think this would be a great route if you have a couple of months and it's your first Camino and you want a challenge and you want to walk through two countries, start back and begin at Lupuy. I think if you've already walked one or two Caminos and you're looking for a different kind of experience, you want to experience a different culture, then I think this is a great Camino for you. I think if you can speak French, it's great. Even if you can't, I think it's a nice challenge. Um, so I hope that you consider this and maybe add it to your list of Caminos for the future and stay tuned for another video coming soon on yet another lesser traveled Camino route. Okay, see you all soon. C'est pour un chant de basse, je suis basse.